Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, Tom Stewart here. I'm with my partner, Liz Trotter, and Derek. Hey. Derek, Derek's is, in the sun, yep, so he's going to look fun. like he's frowning. But I see you're not frowning. You're just in the I'm sun. Frowning. I'm just well lit. Yeah. Well, you are, actually. It looks, uh, looks good. <laughs> um, well, here we are, uh, Wednesday afternoon, another day, uh, more... Uh, PPP uh, information. Uh, we were just chatting before we uh, jumped on the call. Uh, Derek, you want to share some of the latest information we've learned on uh, uh, that's useful regarding how we can get a better outcome off of our PPP dollars? I'm going to hang out with you guys. We talk disease, pestilence, bureaucracy. It's great fun. Um, let's see. Um, over the weekend on Sunday, the SBA issued some new Q&As on their website. They put up three new ones. Okay. One of them was particularly useful uh, because what it said was um, if you offer somebody a job and they don't take it, um, it does not count against you for needing to get back to your full employment for your PPP loan, um, which is kind of a big deal because a lot of us have offered jobs to people to come back and they said they didn't want to. They either got another job or they've decided they enjoy the stress of not working or they're just not ready to come back yet. Um, and that makes it awful hard when we've got to get back to 100% full employment or we've got to pay back the loan. Now, um, Tom and I were talking ahead of time, as Liz pointed out, it is not that informal. Um, you have to give them a written offer. They need to have declined it in writing, and you'll probably need to attach all of that proof to the bank. So I would want to have all my ducks in a row before I did that. Um, and wouldn't necessarily count on needing to make sure you know exactly how many you've got. Um, but I still try plan on trying to get all of mine back. And if I miss by a couple using that, does that make sense? I'm not sure I would, uh, if I had 40 employees plan on bringing 30 back and count on the other 10 declining. So, but, but if you offer someone a job and say, no, I don't want to come back. You want to send them a letter, letting them telling them that they've got their job and give them um, X amount of time to respond and they don't respond, then you document that and keep that in the file. Yeah, it did specifically say a written offer of rehire. So uh, uh, can't just be a quick yeah. phone call. I think or, I'm gonna send that. Yeah, I think a, I'm gonna send mine certified too. Yeah, there's a link in the uh, chat that uh, has a rather extensive article about what we know so far. And like a lot of the articles, it's it's couched in based on what we know now. We'll just have to wait and see how what they actually, you know, interpret and how they use it. But um, it yeah, the interesting thing is it came with an attachment to a 24 page document with 40 questions and answers from the SBA that I've never seen. And I got an a PPP loan from the SBA. So it sure would have been nice to have gotten that ahead of time. Um, but so yeah. that in and of itself was useful. But it's awesome information. It's good news for us. And I, and I, I think part of it is we don't have to go out and hire a bunch of people we don't really want in order to, you know, make some arbitrary number. Yep. I think it's going to give people a uh, definitely a feeling of power back. A lot of uh, business owners yep. have been feeling really powerless, right? Yep. What can I do? They won't come back. Now I'm kind of stuck, but now, yeah, we have a little bit more control again, which is awesome. Well, it's humorous. Is even that little S SBA loan that that little paragraph ends with, and if they decline the offer, they may not uh, be eligible for unemployment anymore anyway. So I thought it was interesting that the SBA threw in that little kicker of, well, why are they still on unemployment then? Right. But, you know, some of the different states are saying that they are still eligible. So. Oh, I agree. In know. fact, the one that was weird to me was Texas. As pro-business as Texas is, Texas is the only state in the United States where you don't have to have workers' compensation insurance. <laughs> Yet in Texas, they said that if an employee says, I'm uncomfortable coming back to work, they can stay on unemployment. They do not need to have a specific reason, medical concern, et cetera. They just need to say, I'm still not comfortable. So the federal law says that that's not a valid reason, but some states are being more lenient. Correct. 
But hey, for loan forgiveness, I care about the federal law. Um, I would keep that. I would keep it documented. And the other really interesting thing about the PPP loan is the SBA is not deciding on what's forgiven. Your bank is deciding on what's forgiven. So you also might want to uh, educate your bank officer. Yeah. Of course, from what I understand, the banks submit all of that to the SBA and the SBA might disagree with what the bank said, in which case the bank doesn't get reimbursed by the SBA. So there's some concern that the banks are going to be really hard nosed about this for fear of, of being caught in the middle. Yeah, I was pretty cautious. I purposely went for less than I could just because I wanted to be sure that I could prove every dime went to payroll. So. Any uh, questions here, Liz? I see I got a comment on my shirt. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> she liked the last one too, but she agrees this one's cuter. Okay. All right. So I, I do actually have a question, Tom. This question was posed to me today by Ruth. Um, she asked this. So we know that the idle $10,000 advance uh, rolls into our PPP in some way. This These monies play together. But how exactly does it work? The $10,000, um, does it increase the amount of our PPP monies that we need to spend? So for easy math, let's say that we got the $10,000 advance from IDLE, and then we also got $100,000 in PPP funds. And we have to spend a minimum of $75,000 toward our paychecks. Right uh, uh, with this hundred thousand. Now that we're rolling in this ten, this additional ten thousand, do we need to pay seventy five thousand, seventy five percent of one hundred ten thousand, or does it reduce it? Now we only have to do ninety thousand, or does it not have anything to do with anything? As I understand it, with the math, the numbers you just 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 uh, gave us. If I got ten thousand dollars in the in the idle advance and another hundred thousand in the PPP, that means that I actually qualified for a hundred and ten thousand in PPP funds, but only got a hundred because they take ten thousand. They take whatever you got in the idle out of the PPP funds that they give you, out of the out of okay. the. Advance. So that makes sense. So the ten thousand is already forgiven, so that's not even part of the math. The way the rules are now, you're not supposed to have to pay yeah. anything. Not so. Again, I can't say a hundred percent sure, but my best judgment would tell me that the hundred thousand you need to spend at least seventy five thousand of that on 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 payroll. If you're you no know, seventy five percent of the hundred thousand needs to go towards payroll. You don't need to worry too much about that other ten thousand because. So why are they making a big deal about it? Oh, just because you can't get um, a, the PPP loan for one hundred and ten thousand because you've already gotten the ten. If you hadn't gotten, the, if you hadn't gotten the idle funds, they would have given you an extra ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so Leslie wants to know. So does she need to create another new account named, named Libel, Idle and then one for her PPP? Um, how does her account know which money is going to which account? you have any ideas? Of what are you doing there, Tom? We're not creating any extra accounts. We're managing it all in QuickBooks. But, you know, I got a, I, I, I have Kyle. <laughs> I got a guy that's really... Uh, uh, you know, it's his job to keep track of all of that. And you can do it all within QuickBooks, just how you code your your, your expenditure. So we're not terribly difficult or, or, excuse me, concerned about that. But um, depending on the level of hope that you have and, and how you're doing it, that would be something that I'd be consulting with with my uh, CPA on and say, look, this is, this is what I got. What processes do I need? And if, uh, you know, I know banks are recommending to, to people that they set up a different account for the PPP. The idle funds are a little bit different. We looked at the criteria for what that could be used for yesterday. And they're a lot more generous. I mean, if basically, if it's a, wow, you still there, Liz? Uh-huh. Okay, your picture went away and Derek just disappeared altogether. Hmm. I'm okay. back. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, 
the idols, there is no, the math on the idol seems to be a lot simpler because there is no calculation at the end trying to figure out how much it was going to be forgiven. You're going to have to pay all of the idol back, but it's going to be over 30 years. Um, and if it's a legitimate business expense, be it, you know, op, be it an operating expense or be it a cost of goods sold, it seems like all that's fair game. You just can't take it and you know, go on vacation with it. As long as you're spending it on your business, it seems like it's you're, you're, you're pretty good on the idol. Um, I'll share a link again. This was what we were looking at yesterday on the idol part. And you know, I'll just share the screen real quick because this yeah, is good. I'll tell you what I did, Leslie. I opened another account for the PPP but I didn't do anything with the idol. I just put it into my operating account. You know, it says here pretty much you can use these funds to cover necessary day-to-day -day expenses. Your business would have uh, successfully covered before coronavirus or other, you know, before the coronavirus. So if it was something that you were traditionally paying for out of your business, you can use these idle funds for that um, out of the list of things that they're giving here. I can't think of much of anything that, that wouldn't be covered by that. But again, this isn't a grant. It's a loan. You're going to have to pay it back, but it's just a really, you know, generous loan with a, with a very long amortization. Hey, Derek. Our internet's a bit spotty. Okay. Um, so, PPP funds you need to keep up with, the idle funds, you're just going to, I don't even know how you're going to pay them back. You know, I guess you get a statement in the mail for the next uh, 360 months. When we start paying them back, is it six months or a year before you have to start paying it back? A year is the last thing I read. Okay. So you don't have to do anything for a year. It's like, hmm, easy, easy peasy. Oh, I'm in the middle now. Derek is really fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy. He's a uh, low bandwidth. Yeah. Having hard. You know, he's in Colorado. That makes sense. And he's fuzzy because everybody's high over there. Hey. That's go. all. That's all. Derek's been eating those gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> that that face just lent um, credence to what he said, Derek. I'm like, huh, what? <laughs> Too many That's people awesome. streaming live videos. We keep losing internet. But anyway. So uh, one of the things that uh, Derek's been really busy uh, doing here, I mean, for a while, but certainly uh, recently, is uh, helping broker some uh, some acquisitions or, or, or sales, I guess, depending on what side of the deal you're on. There's a lot of people out there looking to uh, sell cleaning businesses and other people out there looking to buy them or at least accounts. And we wanted Derek to come on and share a little bit about what he's been doing and, uh, you know, maybe uh, give us some useful information to, to see if we can find some opportunities out there. Yeah, there's been a lot going on. Um, a lot of people have decided they basically don't want to rebuild. Um, that they've done this a couple times maybe in their life or they were close to retirement. And even if they got the money, um, starting over from scratch and rebuilding just doesn't sound like a good time. So a fair amount of folks have started to reach out to people as it's come time to reopen and offer to sell. So we've been getting a lot of emails from people saying, a competitor wants to uh, buy, sell me their business, what should I do? Or vice versa, we've had a couple of people write us and say, Hey, I just don't want to do this anymore. You know, I was borderline and thinking of retiring ahead of time and now I'm ready to sell. So how do I get out of it? So we're seeing a lot of that happening right now. Um, I've been involved in three of those deals recently. Um, one of them is recently as this week and it was a decent sized company. It was about 300,000 in revenue. And the owner just decided that, you know, I'm over 65. I don't want to rebuild again. I just want to sell my customer list to somebody. So under the best of times, when you sell a home cleaning service, you're normally going to sell for two to three and a half times cash flow, which is basically the revenue that your business generated in the last year. The problem right now is nobody has any idea what their business is going to look like in a few weeks. Um, what yeah. your business looked like two months ago is practically irrelevant. Um, 
who's coming back? Which of your customers are coming back? Which of your clients are coming back? Are we going to have another one of these outbreaks again in the fall? And as a result, almost every single deal that I've seen happen, and I've been involved in three in the last two weeks, um, where the businesses were sold based off of the revenue the clients are going to regenerate. Um, basically, the deals normally look like 20% of the revenue for a year or 10% of the revenue from the clients for two years. And there's some variations thereof, but every deal I've seen has kind of happened in that range. With the idea being that as long as I get the customers in, I'll basically give you the person I'm buying it from the profit from those customers for a period of time. But then after that time expires, they're my customers and I get to keep the profit. Um, and that's pretty much the only deal I'm seeing happen right now. Um, because who wants to pay three times of last year's cash flow? Do you have any confidence that that's going to be the cash flow this year? Nobody does. Everyone's just guessing. Um, it's been a really unique opportunity, though, because some people are basically going out there and hoovering up client lists and adding. Uh, in fact, I was talking to one person who's actually bought three customer lists this way now. Um, and if you bring cleaners with it, um, could be a really interesting way to get your PPP count up. If you're worried about, hey, I used to have 40 employees, but now I've only got 30. Well, if I bring on these two little companies and stick them onto mine, now all of a sudden I can potentially have enough people out there to do it. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of that. So I would. So these deals, these deals sound like that they're primarily you're just buying customer accounts rather than all of the assets. Is that right? Um, it depends. Most of the time, people are just buying the customer accounts, um, and normally the cleaners and the equipment. And if there's some equipment, a couple thousand dollars are thrown in. Um, on a couple of occasions, some people have chosen to keep the company name up and running to potentially have a second brand in a market. Um, a couple people I know did that even before COVID. And now that COVID has happened, they're doing it. I've always been a big fan of that model because as you guys know, I used to come from Procter & Gamble where we have Tide, Cheer, and Gain, three different laundry detergents that hit three different customer segments. So if you've got a two-person team running company cars and you buy a solo company, they might decide to keep the name and the brand. But yeah, for the most part, what you're really buying is the customer list and emailing the customers and saying, hey, you know, we decided not to reopen. My close friend so-and-so is going to be taking over the company. And in return, uh, you know, they're going to give me part of the revenue or something like that. Um, and it varies all over the place. I've literally seen just the customers transferred. Um, there was a deal we did re recently where uh, they took over the office space and everything else, which was nice because if you've got a lease with a personal guarantee on the lease and you're closing down, that's worth something. So if I've decided I don't want to reopen my company and I've got a lease that I'm personally guaranteed for for a year, if you're willing to take over that lease so that the landlord can't sue me for 10 grand, that's, that's money that's saved for me. So that's something that you can offer a value or if they've got company cars or things like that. Marlo's asking a question. Um, I, I think that we said if you're buying accounts, just, just accounts, you're usually buying accounts for like somewhere between two to three times the average monthly revenue, not annual, just the monthly revenue. That's the top line that the customers mm -hmm. are paying. Um, if you're buying an entire business, it could be two to three times annual, what they call cash flow, which is, you know, kind of a repass profit type thing. But uh, so you think about two to three times revenue on the top line on a monthly revenue basis, keep the math easy, two times annual revenue, um, excuse me, two times monthly revenue is like 200%. So divide that by 12, that's somewhere between 15 and 20% per month. So getting it over, you know, 20% over one year period is about the same as getting two and a half times all up front, assuming that you didn't have leakage, but you're going to lose customers. So you'd really be better off getting it up front. But like Derek said, nobody's going to want to do that because you don't know how many of those customers are even going to come back for cleaning number one. Yeah. So Marlo was asking, you know, under normal conditions, you normally sell a multiple of profit or cash flow. Or how much money do you make a year? So if you're trying to sell your business normally, you want to try to make your business as profitable as possible. Maybe cut an office staff, run with a VA to get that profit margin up. Um, so say you have a 20% margin and you sell for three times that, you're actually getting about 60% of revenue. But if you can get it up to 25% profit margin, three times that, 75%. So, But that's normal condition. That's not what we're in right now. Right now we're in a fire sale. Um, Right now, there's there's too much unknown. Um, so you might get lucky. You never know. 
But every deal I've seen has been where people are paying some percentage of revenue over a period of time. And there's a little bit of a have and have not thing happening right now, because those of us that got some PPP funds or an idle loan have a chunk of money potentially to spend. Those that didn't have no cash. Um, so once again, we've mentioned before, if you were running an independent contractor model, you do not qualify for PPP funding except for maybe you and your office staff. Um, so you didn't get a hundred thousand dollar, one hundred and fifty thousand dollar forgivable loan. Um, those of us that did um, have an opportunity to maybe pick up some accounts out there. Now, be mindful; those PPP funds uh, specifically would not. You wouldn't want to use those funds to go buy another business or, or a list. But presumably, if you're cleaning some homes, you've got income coming from other areas. So. This is where keeping good books is useful, where you can show on the books, the PPP funds are covering payroll and this other money that you've got over here that customers are paying you. That's how you're financing your acquisition. Right. And what exactly? You wouldn't technically use your PPP funds, but I don't know about you guys. If I have free labor because of PPP funds, I have a whole bunch of free cash flow coming out of my company that I can do something with which gives me a pretty big competitive advantage that I can do stuff with, assuming I'm cleaning houses. Um, and this is also a really good example. You know, we have a program that we've been offering called business staging for a while, which helps people sell their companies. And one of the things that we always talk about in business staging is you need to sell your business when you have plenty of time um, because you don't want to sell your business when you have to, you want to sell your business when it's convenient for you and when you have a good offer. And selling a business is a really what we call in economic speak, illiquid market, meaning there's not that many people in it. Um, at any given time, there can be two people selling a business and one buyer, which is a horrible situation to be in, or one person selling their business and two buyers, which is a great situation to be in. Unfortunately, we're in a situation right now- Only if you're the seller. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, I'm saying if you're the seller right now, we're in a situation where you don't want to be selling your business. It's not a good time because almost everyone's selling. So it's almost the classic example of when we we've, we've taught all this time. You want to have your business up for sale before you need to. You don't want to wait until you've been relocated. You don't want to wait until you're right up against retirement. Um, when I sold my business, my maid service, it actually wasn't technically up for sale. They literally knocked on my door and said, I want to buy your business. Well, that gave me a whole bunch of negotiating leverage. Um, the environment we're in right now is the complete opposite situation. Uh, most people don't have a lot of negotiating leverage. Um, so we had some questions come in about non-competes and things like that. Um, I would get as, a, as long a non-compete as I could um, at a minimum, probably a year, but I'd want two years. And technically you're probably gonna want a non-solicitation agreement if you can. Um, non-solicitation agreements are normally more effective than non-competes. Um, you can't normally stop somebody from working in their chosen profession. So if I buy your client list and you decide later on you want to clean, it's in most states not enforceable for me to say, well, wait, they sold me their clients. They can't be a cleaner anymore. But what is enforceable is to say, they sold me their clients. They're my clients now. They can't solicit them. So I would do a non-solicitation agreement for a period of time. Uh, probably I'd want at least two years. Yeah. Uh, there's all sorts of, so I also just want to say there's all sorts of um, small, really, really small micro businesses that are out there right now. Uh, maybe with one or two employees. I just bought a client list from, from one of those little tiny companies for $50 per client. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Easy numbers. One of the things I recommend doing is just running some ads on Craigslist, just literally saying, hey, you know, if you're thinking of going out of business, give me a call. I might be willing to buy your clients. Um, that has worked well for me in the past. And yeah, it's normally not bigger companies. You're normally not going to buy out your biggest competitor because they've got the financial wherewithal to withstand it like you do. It's the people who, I mean, if you're an independent with one assistant helping you and you just had to shut down for six weeks and you didn't have any savings, especially if you're in the state of Ohio, where as of now, independent contractors still can't draw unemployment. Um, you've got a real abject lesson on why maybe you want to have a job and they're willing, they just want to go away. What are your recommendations if you're running these ads? Would you run black box ads where you're not listing the name of your company or would you say, Hey, you know, my name's Derek Christian. I own blah, 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 cleaning company. Would you, would you put your name of your company in the ad? 
I normally don't. Um, when I've done this, I've just run an ad that said, if you're interested, give me a call. Now, when they call, I tell them. I'm not making it a big secret. Um, right. But I, I just normally prefer my ads to be more customer facing. Um, now, I've also uh, have had someone call competitors before and we'll probably have it again where we'll just call and leave a lot of messages hey this is derek with you know my maid service uh some companies aren't reopening if you're thinking of that let us know we'd like to maybe potentially buy your client list in that case i would but on craigslist where the whole world can see it no i don't think i'd want to put my name on it you mentioned the idea of of buying a company in, in the same market that you're already in, but keeping that brand and running two different businesses. Yep. Would, would they be a different model, a different price point? How would you do that to create? In general, if I had two companies, I'd want them to have different business models. Um, I wouldn't want to be having two companies that run too similar to each other uh, because then they don't really have a reason to be unique, if that makes sense. Um, I like the idea, like when I ran solos with my maid service, every now and again, I'd be on the phone with a customer that I just couldn't convince that solos were the way to go. Well, I work at home. I want people in and out of the house quickly, or I've hired independents before. I don't like that idea. And it sure would have been nice if I could have been like, well, here's a company I recommend that runs a team model that you might like that I also happen to own. Uh, now, I wouldn't necessarily tell them that, but I would recommend that one to them. And once again, it goes back to the gain and tide example. They're both laundry detergents, but they're very different in that, you know, tides, everything tide advertises is we clean the best. We have the best technology. Gain's whole advertising campaign is we smell great. Our products have the best sense. So, you know, I would be doing the same thing with my solo versus team. I would probably talk a lot about on my team efficient we were, how well trained we were, how professional the car looks, all that kind of stuff. On solos, I would talk about you're going to have a close relationship with the person who cleans your house. You're going to have fewer people in your house, you know, better security, more personalized. So that's kind of how I would do it so that when your message doesn't land with company A, it might land with company B. Would you use the same management for both? Probably not. Um, I personally think it's difficult to do both. Um, and I definitely probably wouldn't run it out of the same office. Um, I, at various times, that sounds have tried scary. To, huh? That sounds scary. What's like, up? That too many mistakes waiting to happen there. Too many mistakes waiting to happen. And I, I've run different business models out of the same company before. Like at my maid service for a little while, we were running teams and solos, and it turned into a bit of a disaster for me because the people on the teams were always mad that the solos made more money, and the solos were always mad that the teams didn't work as hard. And I'm like, yes, that's why you're paid more. And so it just seems like everyone wants what the other half has. So just keeping them separate works better. And let's be clear, I am not recommending you run two separate models. Um, there is a lot of, you've got to have your core company do a certain size and scale and running like a machine before you conquer that issue. Um, I'm just saying that I've seen a couple of people do it. Um, you know, I, I know of probably four companies off the top of my head. Now all four of them, their, their first company does a million and a half or more in revenue already. So these aren't people running half million dollar companies. These are people who've got a company that's already making really good money. And they're now going, you know what? Maybe I want to have a different brand that generates another half a million over here. We uh, bought a company. This is, I'm going back a few years, but it was a different business model, different price point, different scope of work. So we decided to set it up as a separate company and we ran two different brands, but we're running it out of one office and the management was kind of doing both at the same time. And it was not a great experience. And after doing that for about a year and a half, we wound up taking the customers that were left over from the, from the company that we acquired and we just converted them into castle keepers and just got out of that game. Yeah. I mean, I, once again, I'm not necessarily recommending it. The ones that I know do have a different office. They typically use VAs for the second company so that it doesn't even touch the primary company. They run a very different model, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I've seen happening a lot right now, and honestly, I don't know if any of the three of us are experts to talk about it, but it's been really interesting. And I would be a little gun shy. A lot of the companies that I've seen up for sale right now specialize in Airbnb cleaning. Um, those guys are dying. Absolutely yeah. dying right now. Yeah, they're laying off a bunch of staff, and I understand a lot of their hosts. I saw something where 
a bunch of their hosts are getting together, standing up a platform to kind of do the same thing and cutting Airbnb out of it. Yeah. So the folks that are doing that vacation rental cleaning are in pretty brutal shape. Um, now there's some opportunity there that Airbnb is now requiring an enhanced level of cleaning and that you're supposed to have a cleaning certified, a certified cleaner do the work. And so I do think long-term some opportunity over there, but I'd be real careful jumping into buying an Airbnb customer list because the whole game's changing right now. Yeah. We do have a couple of questions over here, Derek. Uh, so Leslie wants to know, how do you, you know, how do you handle it when you are like a higher price co company and then you're buying the jobs from somebody who charges quite a bit less than you do? How, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, well, a couple things you got to know about it. Um, first of all, are you more efficient? Um, we've bought some companies that seem to charge less than us in the past, but as we dug in, they weren't very good at cleaning, didn't train their people very well. So while it took their people five hours to clean a house, it took our people three and a half and their hourly rate didn't look as bad as it did first on paper. So that's the first thing I'd say is do a little bit of research. Um, second thing is just be honest with them. The one that I was involved with this week, um, we're planning on taking them from $30 an hour to $40 an hour and told the person we're buying the company from, hey, we are going to, over the next six months, raise the rates by $10 an hour. So don't be surprised when some of the customers go away. Um, I We did feel the need to be honest with the person we're buying the customers from, so they're not surprised with that later on. And she completely understood. And her big question was, so if the revenue goes up, do I get 10% of that higher revenue? And we're like, yes, you do. And she's like, okay, well, I, I get it. You know, I probably should have done a price increase all along. So my, my first point is just do some research. Um, just because it takes them four hours to clean, it might not take you four hours to clean. Um, second thing is don't be afraid to do price increases. Um, you know, wh while this stuff with PPP is going on, I might be tempted to keep their employees, their pay rates, their customers, just so I can keep the staff on payroll and hit my equivalents. But soon as that was over, I'd be raising rates. You know, Remember, you know go ahead. doing research, it's, you know, it's important to look at the data and figure out what they're charging per, per labor hour. But at the same time, get a sample of the homes that they're cleaning on a recurring basis and you quote them yourself and you figure out what you would charge to clean those homes. And a lot of times the homes are priced fine, but like Derek said, they just are slow. So it, it might not be as bad as you think. Right. I mean, what, for example, one of the companies that I was working with recently, um, they send their teams in with three separate caddies, 12 different cleaners, four mops. I'm like, what? You know, what? I'm like, this should be much simpler. Um, there was so much opportunity for streamlining and efficiency in there. So I think that we're going to be a lot more okay. But that's the great thing about paying on a percentage of revenue. If you're paying 10% of what the customer brings in for the next 12 months and you have to raise the price by a third, do you care if they quit? Yeah. So, you know, that's, so, that's the whole point. Uh, we have a, another, oh, there is one more thing I wanted to say. Um, I, another thing, the reason why I was able to buy these customers so inexpensively as well, this client list, is because she, uh, the lady that owned the company, she and one other, and sometimes two other people were still cleaning on their own together. And so that is not ideal. Going from an owner operator cleaner to cleaning person cleaning to you know a cleaning company that's a hard transition for customers to make. And so um, I, I think of it as kind of like um, when you break up with somebody or somebody you know they there's a breakup. That rebound person is not the best position. You don't really want to be in that rebound position if you can help it. It's kind of better to be like the second one out. So that yeah. was a, a, another thing to be thinking about. Have you that. started getting the calls saying that, um, sorry, American Made, you guys just aren't the same as the lady who used to clean my home? We haven't, but I know that we will. And that's why we're only paying 50 bucks for each client that, you know, that, and they have to, they have to have at least one cleaning. So, yeah. because who knows how many, you know, but I know that we are going to have that. 
Yeah, it's always interesting when you buy client lists. When I with my maid service, we bought a little company called Dove Cleaning at one point, and we had a ton of people call in and complain, saying that my people weren't cleaning the toilets. And I'm like, I'm very confident my people clean the toilets. We've been doing this a long time. And as we dug into it, we found out that Dove had always trained their people that when they were done cleaning, they were to leave the toilet seats up. And my people were taught when they were done cleaning, they were to put the toilet seats down. And so when the customer came in and the toilet seats were all down, they would call us and say we didn't clean the toilets. They could tell because the covers were down we're like okay so something that small when you're buying a company can cause issues which is why it's a beautiful thing to buy only on a percentage of revenue because once again if they don't stick it doesn't matter now it depends on what your goal is here if you want to try to keep as many of those customers long term what i recommend you do is you run it as close to the old model and maybe even keep the old name for a while six months to three months and only then tell people that it was even sold hey, by the way, so-and-so retired. I took over a couple months ago. We've got some changes coming. Here's what it looks like. Because then they're like, well, wait a minute. You've what, what do you mean? You've already cleaned my house a couple times. It wasn't a big difference. Um, when I sold my maid service uh, to Blue Skies, that's actually what they did. For the first three months, they didn't even change the name, tell the customers, do anything. And there was almost no customer loss rate. Um, when they bought another company, they instantly changed it all to blue skies, went in and changed the whole business model and they lost 50% of the customers off the bat. So they kind of learned that let's go softly at first. That's now, lower. But this all depends on what you're, what you're, what's important to you. Um, for those of you that haven't reopened yet, hopefully most of you have reopening sucks. It's hard. Um, you're rebuilding your schedules, your customers are going to tell you they want to be cleaned. And then the morning of, they're going to change their mind. It's a scheduling nightmare, like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. Um, so normally my concern would be let's run this other company in the way to maximize revenue. Right now, my personal concern is I need to make it as easy to run my company as possible because running my company is difficult and a pain in the butt right now. So I probably would go with the switch it to my business model. And if I lose, lose half of the revenue, oh, well approach right now, just because my life is so difficult. Um, now, if I was in a normal world where my team was humming, my schedule was pretty much set, then I might do what I just recommended, which was keep the other company running the way it used to, even though because it's harder on me. It keeps the customers, but it's harder on me. And right now, I'm not really interested in things that are harder on me. Uh, we have some more questions here, you guys. Uh, let's see, where'd it go? Sarah wants to know, is there a best or ideal sized business to buy? Do you guys have a uh, an opinion on that? I don't think there is. I've seen all different sizes. Probably the thing that makes the biggest difference is how close do they operate to you? Um, if their business model looks, feels, behaves a lot like yours, you're going to lose less customers. Um, the bigger that delta is between them and you, the more problems you're going to have. If they are a green cleaning company that runs two-person teams and you're going to switch to my model, which was solos that use the harshest chemicals you could, we're going to lose a whole bunch of customers. Um, so that's the type of stuff that you've got to kind of be careful with. So more so than type or size, I'd be concerned on business model. Um, the closer the business model is to you, the more likely it is to stick. Now, if you're going to be buying it to run it as an independent company, I wouldn't want to buy anything less than $300,000 in revenue because we've talked before about the phrase, what we call our valley of despair, which is that phase between about $100,000 and $350,000 in revenue where it just sucks to run a business. Yeah, yeah let somebody else do that. If you're putting it into, you're going to roll those accounts, you're just buying accounts and rolling it into your own business. If the model fits and the what their 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 bill rate is is fitting what, what you currently do and the scope of work matches, it could be a big business, small business, really doesn't matter, especially if you're you're buying it on some rev share over a period of time. Be careful about buying a small business and standing up in a separate office and you're gonna put a lot of extra cash in it getting it to the point where it's uh self sufficient. So yep. we have another question here. Sarah wants to know. Uh, your guys thoughts on buying a cleaning business 50 50 with another local cleaning uh, company as a second business so it would be like a second business for both of you doesn't make me terribly excited life is complicated enough without partners um when you when you run a partnership it gets tricky um it, it's true says the guy who's 
How many partners do you have, Derek? Yeah, you must have like 25. He doesn't take tough. his own advice. <laughs> no, I don't. But, you know, it's very difficult when you have partners. There's so much stuff that has to overlap. There's so much that's involved in it. Um, it, it it's difficult, so. Yeah. But the question would be, why would you want to do that? Is there some synergy there? Do, you know, like if you're really good at marketing and your partner, the person who's going to be partners on the other 50% is really good, like in operations on the back end, you know, I mean, there could be some scenarios where, you know, the, 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 the whole is worth more than the parts, but you need to have a bigger strategic reason than just because it's convenient because yeah. There's, there's I mean, work. It's not, it's not all fun and games and, and roses. Well, partnerships are just tricky at the end of the day. Um, you know, Which Robin you says, but we got three partners right here on the call. Yeah. yeah. But, yes. I mean, hey, you, Robin. Have, <laughs> Good to see you. you know, one of the fun things about a business is you can literally wake up one day and say, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to do this. And you just do it. And by the end of the day, it's up and running. And when you've got partners, everything's slower. Everything takes more time. And to be clear, I've got a lot of partners. I'm not necessarily complaining about my two partners on the call. Um, <laughs> but it's just more difficult. It's a lot easier when you can just do it on your own. And sometimes there's just stylistic differences. Um, I, Tom and I joke about this, but every time we do a presentation, I walk on the stage and completely wing it. And he's about to have a heart attack every time I do it because he's like, what are you presenting? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to see what questions they ask. I'm going to go from there. And if you can imagine trying to run a company with somebody who's approached everything is I'm just going to wing it, and make it up as I go. Um, I can be a little frustrating to work with. So um, you just got to that's that's what I mean. So, and I mean, there's so many different dimensions of that risk tolerance, you know, personal objectives. I mean, it's you, you need to do your homework and, and think long and hard. I mean, it can be great, and you know, there's you know, give you a lot of examples where having a partner has created a lot more value than not having a partner, but. It doesn't always work out that way. So you, you really need to do your homework. I'm what, not do you, saying it's, what do you think, Liz? Bail us out of this. <laughs> I, I'm yeah, not saying no. it's not worth it. I'm saying it's hard. And especially right now, I'm not a big fan of telling people to make their lives more complicated. Um, for perspective, I think I read something that said, right now, our economic numbers are worse than the Great Depression. So right now, chances are your grandparents didn't live through an economy as bad as this. Your great-grandparents did. And... With all of that going on, do you really want to figure out a partnership right now? Yeah. It, just, it just doesn't strike me as a great idea. Yeah, it, it, just it my honest opinion. Now, the all good right, news so is... Go ahead, Gary. I said the good news is we're probably going through the worst thing that will ever happen in your life, hopefully, So uh, economically. So th this should be the bottom. Well, we haven't seen the bottom yet. We're on our way, but... Yeah. At the moment, we're all drunk with all of this money that the government's throwing out there. But there's a time coming where you know it's going to get more complicated. Yep. The I hangover. Agree. The yeah. hangover is coming. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see. We got a couple more questions. Amber wants to know what everyone's using their idol and PPP for. We'll get to that in just a little bit, Amber. I won't forget. Um, I want to make sure that we get everybody's questions answered about buying businesses and selling. Uh, Dana, how did you get your sale? Um, no, so a uh, funny story, when this all happened, I reached out to all of my local competitors thinking, hey, well, except for one, you know who you are. Anyway, I, um, I got together with, or uh, reached out to everybody because I wanted to, you know, sort of coalesce this, uh, 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 all of the cleaning businesses and figure out how we could work together. And um, it, it didn't actually get off the ground in the way I wanted because everybody was stressed out and, you know, and I just sort of flying by the seat of their pants. Uh, but this one woman, she was one of the people I had reached out for, to, uh, went, had, had a customer call and, or a potential lead call and say she wanted to have an in-home estimate. And we don't really do in-home estimates anymore. We have them for a, quite a few years. Uh, if somebody really presses us, we will, but, you know, once every six months, maybe. So this lady said that 
her cleaning company was going out of business and she didn't really feel comfortable. She wanted to have somebody come in. So I went there and found out, oh, it was this woman that, you know, I had tried to contact. So I just reached out to her and said, hey, looks like you're selling your business. What the heck? Let's make a deal. She said, okay, Monty. Only so old people will do that. Interesting. So if you have anybody doing sales for you, one of the things that you'd want them to be listening for is any clues that, you know, somebody's looking for a quote because their old cleaning company is out of business. And you, I mean, that would be a, a really cool way to, to, to find those acquisition leads. Yeah. yeah a, lot come, a lot come from just networking with others in the industry. Um, the one I got in Cincinnati Dove Cleaning was somebody I knew um, building those relationships up because when it comes, comes time to close, a lot of times they want to sell to the person who helped them, um, particularly if they know they're selling uh, at not the ideal situation. So it gives a good opportunity for them to go, you know what, at this point, you know, I know I'm not going to be getting maximum dollar. I'd like to give the business to somebody I know and trust. Yeah. And the woman that I bought these clients from, she wasn't even going to do anything. She wasn't reaching out to anybody. She was just closing up. She just wasn't going to clean anymore. She was afraid. She didn't want to go into clients' homes. She didn't want to take her employee into clients' homes. She just, she's like, no, I'm done. So 50 clients, done, not doing that. So she was just going to drop them. So it ended up working out really well for me. A lot of people get afraid and they just don't know how to move forward either. Yeah. Her, her thinking about how like having to restart was just more than she could even deal with. The other thing which you'll want to look at, we didn't get into everything when you're buying somebody's look at their customer list, see how long they've had their customers, what type of relationship they have. Um, there's a lot of the newer companies that churn customers a lot um, that are almost more on demand. Honestly, their customer list probably isn't worth as much. Um, you know, a company like some of the ones I've been involved in recently, most of them had good multi-year long-term customers, a strong relationship with the owner, a good work process, a strong brand. You know, those are more likely to stick. Um, those are kind of the things you, you want to look at. Um, are you going to be able to keep the employees? Keeping the employees is key. Um, honestly, I don't, I'd almost be more interested in the employees than I would the uh, customers because one of the things I've always said is when I've got a good cleaner, their schedule almost seems to magically fill up on their own because when they clean a house, the customers are happy and get on the schedule. So I'd want to see how long those cleaners have been there. You know, do they have any type of quality ratings? What type of ratings did they have? You know, that's what's kind of unique about this. Normally when you get that company that is about to, that's willing to sell at fire sale prices, their cut employees are terrible. Um, it's normally the employees that have stressed the owner out so much that they want to throw in the towel and quit. Right now, the companies that I'm seeing, by and large, have good employees. The manager's a good manager. The employees are good. Um, you know, it's a good situation. Um, it's just literally, you know, sometimes you just don't want to do it again. Uh, it's literally, you know, rebuilding the company sucks. One of the things that we learned with Castle Keepers with opening multiple branches is doesn't matter how many times you've done it. When you open a new office, it sucks. And <laughs> this whole, you know, PPP, this whole PPP thing is needing to restart. And if you are already thinking maybe now, I, it, maybe it's within a year or two of me wanting to retire, would you really want to rebuild? So there are some really good companies with really good managers, with really good employees that are up right now that you normally wouldn't be able to buy. So that's why I've been interested is because you're not doing disasters. You're doing good companies and good things. And, you know, there's some really interesting opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been there. You want to make sure that it's clearly understood, though, that you're going to be interviewing the employees and you don't have to hire any of them if you don't want to. And you want to find out if anybody has any workers comp you know, cases that are open or, you know, any other issues that would make them uh, less desirable and only hire the people that, that, that are really going to be the best fit for you. And what we've been primarily talking about is acquiring accounts. So you want to make sure that in the deal, you're, you're, you're covering the fact that you aren't buying the company, you aren't even buying all the assets. You're just taking over the accounts and consideration for some rev share. So if a customer comes back a month later and, want you to fix the 
marble countertop that the previous owner damaged, that's not on you, that's on them. I mean, those are just all kinds of crazy things will pop up that you can't anticipate until they pop up. No. Well, any, you guys have any more questions about what uh, opportunities this might bring up for you or how you can take advantage of these different opportunities? Anybody on the call thinking, yeah, I'm ready to get out. I'm, I'm with them. I'm ready to sell my, sell my clients. Uh, I did have one more thing that I was thinking. Oh, I, you know, I wanted to comment about your workers comp thing, uh, Tom. That was so surprising for me when we bought our first branch. Like, I never would have thought of that because I know that you're buying. Um, I mean, you have to rehire all of the employees. But it just sort of seemed, I just never would have thought of it. I would have been like, okay, they're already on the payroll. Okay, just, you know, hire them. Just take them on. But that was a great idea. And we actually found somebody that had a worker's comp claim. And we didn't end up hiring them. And I was like, oh. Well, one more thing that I wanted to point out is for those of you that are hiring right now, I don't know if the situation is the same for you as it is for me. But right now, we've had more applicants in the last week than we've had in the last three months. So there are a ton of people, at least here, looking for work. What so, time are you from? Where are coming from? Um, all over the place. We're getting, we just got um, somebody applied, actually starting work tomorrow, that um, just moved here, lived here two months out of the military. So gonna, that's, that's a job. Um, uh, one of the guys, some, what was he doing? Oh, he was in construction and, you know, we've opened light construction here, but there still isn't enough work. So he's starting day after tomorrow. Um, I don't know. We have, we have a quite a few new ones. I'm just assuming from all over. Hotels are like at 25% occupancy. Most restaurants are shut down. It would just seem like there oh, yeah. would be tons of restaurants. people. That's what we're getting. A ton of servers, a ton mm -hmm. of servers. Yeah, in Ohio, we're seeing the gig economy because once again, we still have not opened up unemployment for independent contractors in Ohio. So if you were an Uber driver or one of those guys, um, you either work for Instacart because that's about the only gig job still open or you got to go get a job and they're, they're lining up. There are a lot of those driving jobs around here. Um, you know, they deliver for Costco, Walmart, all of the food places here now are on, um, um, what's it called, all the different ones, I can't even think what they're called, uh, where you order the food, can't even think. Um, Robin, are you advertising for employees? No, this Facebook, well, Facebook, yeah, we're advertising on Facebook, free, not, not a fancy ad, <laughs> nothing great, just a, hey, do you need a job? We need some employees, and people are like, yeah, I need a job, I need a job, I need a job. Um, uh, Sarah has an overflow of applications from Indeed. So yeah, you're sounds like you're running the same thing I'm having, Sarah. And and the applicants are good. That that's the thing that I'm really liking. So they're really good applicants. Almost everybody that comes through are like, Yeah, we'll hire you. Yeah, we'll hire you. So I'm thinking June thirtieth is gonna hit well, I'm gonna have more employees instead of less. Derek uh, um, mentioned that in Ohio, the independent contractors still aren't getting unemployment yet. Well, in California, they are, but California is turning around and suing Uber and Lyft, saying that they misqualified uh, their employees as independent contractors. And we told you that this was coming, that you know, once the dust settles on this thing, it's going to be a whole lot harder for companies like cleaning companies to say that they have independent contractors when the states had to pay out unemployment uh, benefits to them. So you're seeing the first over here, this, uh, this just came out today, but you're gonna see more and more of this. So moving forward, it's gonna, you're gonna see fewer companies, I believe, that are gonna be doing independent contractors in this industry. It's gonna be scarier for sure. So Laura and Aja, go ahead, go ahead. Derek. I said, I think you're gonna see fewer people willing to be independent contractors as well. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, they've discovered they have no safety net and what that means. You know, a lot of people have only been in the economy since 2008 when everything was up, 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 and it doesn't matter. I'll never be unemployed. I hustle. You know, they'd be like, I'll, I'll never be unemployed. I know how to hustle. Well, guess what? They're unemployed. Okay. So. 
So we're, we're kind of getting up the hour here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just show you real quickly. We still have uh, a lot of people asking about uh, the training programs that we're doing over at Modern Cleaning. Still got a lot of people signing up and doing the uh, COVID-19 class. If you haven't done that, uh, it's, 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 it's an awesome class and something that anybody that's cleaning homes, uh, you know, residential should should be doing right now in a COVID-19 world. It's like, uh, it takes about three hours to get through and there's a test at the end certification uh, of completion you get at the, at the end of the class. It, uh, it costs $39 and there's two ways you can enroll. You can enroll just by clicking on um, over here. And that's just a one-off if you just wanna sign up one person and go right now, or you can do bulk by uh, you know, for, for multiple people and get discounts if you uh, click over here and the other class, which we just launched today, and you're going to see some talented people on there. Our first class came out today, and and Liz and, and, and Matt Ricketts uh, presented uh, that first class on what professionalism is in the residential cleaning industry. There's seven classes in total, and the other six are going to be rolling out over the course of May. This class is designed for cleaning professionals, the technicians, the people that are actually cleaning homes every day. So we wanted to make it accessible. So we're taking the classes, we're putting them in a, in a learning management system. So uh, every every uh, candidate, every every student can log in and take these classes when it's convenient for them. There is a uh, exam at the end, a certificate of completion that they get at, at the end of that. and. Um, it really is the difference between having a job and, and, and looking at what you do as a profession. And I don't know, I, I think it's one of the most awesome things we've ever done. But you can go down here, it's got bulk uh, pricing, discount pricing, and your various options for getting it are just basically uh, clicking on that link right there and it takes you to, to the store. Um, the other thing I want to show with you, show to you is cleaning business today. Um, if you haven't subscribed over here to the right, just give us your email address and your name and you'll get on our newsletter that goes out, what, about every other week, Derek? Yep. And our secret uh, stash of resources is coronavirus downloads. I'll take this link. Oops, no, I won't. What did I just do? I'll take this link and I'll paste it in here. Laura and Aja, you said you guys are not having people show up for interviews. I'm assuming that you're doing Zoom interviews. Um, uh, we're having such good luck of having people show up for their interviews. Just um, maybe check times, change time of day, something like that. Um, we are giving uh, lots of options. I don't know if that's helpful. I, I don't know what the deal is there, but I, maybe check time of day. Hey, Rosemary, same as me, right? Great applicant pool, it's so awesome. I'm just waiting for Tom to pull up. You, I got it, Tom. What do we want to pull up? Um, you were showing the uh, resources. You said you were uh, modern uh, cleaning business today. Yeah. You yep. said I'm just gonna post this link. Oh, it, it, you already it's did it. I'm sorry. Yep. I see it. It just popped up on my screen. <clears throat> all right. So there's where your resources are. I people ask me all the time or the, where they are right there uh katarina um what is the average sal salary for cleaning technicians Ooh, sorry katarina you're gonna have to do a little bit of um investigative work in your exact area in your market that can be anywhere from 25 dollars to 75 dollars per maid hour huge range you're gonna have to figure that one out um b is it too late to join the class nope Absolutely not. Uh, Tom just showed you where you did show modern cleaning in the yeah. first thing, right, Tom? Go to modern classes. And and we'll do it again. Okay, so Bree, what happened? First you said you were wanted to join the class, been cleaning by yourself for 30 years, and then you got younger. You're only been cleaning for 20 years now. I see how you did that. Uh, okay. It looks like you might have made a mistake the first time. Yeah, so here you go. That's the one on the right of your class. The B, if you go to moderncleaning.com, click right here, and it'll take you to the professional house cleaning program. And it tells you more about the class. And click on this link, and it'll take you over. Well, 
click on this link and it'll take you to the actual store where you can add stuff to your cart and you don't want 53 classes but you know if you just want one for yourself you just plug in one and check out um, again the first class is live the other six will be uh, posted over the course of May we'll be rolling out about you know I don't even say that they'll all all seven will be up by the end of May and um, Liz is, is helping Matt Ricketts. We've got, we've got several people. Uh, Joe Walsh has been a regular on this. Uh, Joe's a big part of this. My wife, Janice is uh, kind of heading the effort up. She's the, uh, the brain trust on, on a lot of this uh, science of cleaning and hygienic cleaning and um, just basically a, a big part of putting together the original HCT program. So this has been a project that actually we've had in, in the works for, for, for the last 10 years. And we got about 70% done. And it was just like one of those things that we never really pushed it over the finish line. But with uh, COVID-19, it became apparent that we really needed to pick it up and do the last 30% and get it out there. So uh, we're getting a lot of positive response. This is exciting. So Tom, I'm going to let you um, answer Missy Rogers question. She says for the classes at $99, is that the discounted price? or should it check out at half the price with the discount? The one, if you're buying just one class, it's $99. We had a introductory discount program that Liz, we announced what for the last week or so maybe? Yeah, it's been a full and, week. And when did we, and every time we announced it, we said it was going to expire when we went live, right? Yeah. And we yeah. said that, and we said if we didn't make it expire when we went live, it wouldn't be fair for all the people that were signing up before we went live. So Liz told me that I had to take it down today at noon. So so yeah. our, our technical people did that. Um, but you can get so I'm making, And I'm making Tom answer this question because I wanted him to say live that he did take it down because I told him, get it down at noon. And I'm glad to hear you did, Tom. Good job. And um, if you buy like six or more, you get a 15% discount. If you buy like up to 50, if you got a larger company, you still get a 50% discount. So it's really a function of, of, of how many classes you're buying. But if you get anywhere from one to five, it's, it's uh, the, published rate, $99. I'm glad you're enjoying the webinars, Missy. Uh, we're enjoying uh, doing them as well. Uh, oh, good luck with your dream there, B. Seems I missed it. Yeah, you missed it by a few hours there. Sorry about that, Missy. But if you can buy a, a couple more, you can still get a pretty good discount. Just go to the bulk, the bulk if you, option. If you think about, you know, a technician should probably generate what fifteen hundred dollars a week at least twelve hundred a week and what you're paying per hour and it's like an eight hour class with the test um ninety nine dollars for the difference between a job versus a profession and you know everything from the self-esteem to, to to gaining a deeper appreciation for how important your job is and all the different dimensions that that you're being that, that trust is being placed in, in you as a, a cleaning professional. And, you know, we talk about surfaces, we talk about chemicals, we talk about, uh, you know, the, the science of cleaning. We talk about uh, the, the, the tools that we use. There's so many different dimensions of this that we're not just talking about the what to do. We're talking about the whys behind it and sharing that. So, you have a completely different perspective on your job after going for this class. And again, we're making this for the people that are cleaning homes every day, making it accessible to them. I mean, there are other, I mean, I don't think there's an option out there that provides this much value for, for, for $99. That's really about as, no. as good as we yeah, can. Do. There is not. So it looks like Robin has already watched the first module. Yay. Okay. He said we did a good job on that. Great. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Missy, I'm with you, Missy. I do not like to miss a deal either. Yeah. Bane of my existence at times. So I totally understand. Uh, okay. Anything else? Do you have anything else you want to wrap up with, Derek? 
I'm yeah. glad you're on the call today. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm busy. Yeah, I oh, know. Yeah. Buying and selling companies. Okay, guys. Well, well, thank you and appreciate everybody cool. being here with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, be back tomorrow, same time, 5 o'clock Eastern. One quick thing. So Amber had asked, what is everybody set spending their PPP and their idle monies on? And I said I wouldn't forget and we would get to it. And guess what? Eh, here we are. So if everybody could at least post one thing that you're spending your idle or your PPP monies on to help Amber. That would be awesome. <laughs> Thank Payroll. you guys. Payroll. Payroll. Yeah. But how are you doing that? Okay. Thanks. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Rosemary, it wasn't live. So the recording is up. Yeah. Yep. Thanks guys. Bye y'all. <laughs>